Welcome to The Stream. I'm Ahmed Shabuddin, sitting in for Femi Oke. Okay. Tens of thousands of people in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo have been forced to flee their homes as government forces battle the resurgent M23 militia. Now, as the rebels draw closer to the major city of Goma, we look at how civilians are coping and ask what it will take to bring the fighting to an end. Joining us for today's conversation, Reagan Miviri is an activist with Lucha, a youth-based civil society movement. He joins us from Goma. Also in Goma, we have Malcolm Webb. He's a senior Al Jazeera correspondent. And completing our lineup from Goma, Grant Laity is UNICEF's representative in DR Congo. Thank you so much for joining us, um, all three of you. And remember, you can always send us your comments, your questions here on YouTube, and I'll be sure to put them to our guests directly. So let's uh, start with a little bit of basic background to this conflict. Uh, M23, or the March 23rd movement, is a mostly Congolese Tutsi militia. Now in 2012, it briefly seized Goma, the capital of North Kivu province. And in 2013, the government and M23 reached a peace deal. But in late 2021, M23 resumed fighting, saying that the government had not kept its promises. As M23 leads a new offensive now in North Kivu, the Congolese government says neighboring Rwanda is giving support to the rebels. The government in Kigali denies any involvement. Now, with those facts in mind, I want to just start by kind of addressing the why. Why is this happening? Malcolm, uh, if you had to kind of boil it down, why are we seeing this renewed uh, violence? Uh, well, it's not just Congo's government that uh, accuses Rwanda uh, of involvement. I mean, uh, UN investigators uh, leaked a report earlier this year. We, mm -hmm. We've seen photographs of Rwandan soldiers with M23. Even videos we've received, video releases from M23, show their fighters wearing uh, Rwandan equipment. Equipment, and, and, uh, and it doesn't come. Rwanda does deny it, and we always include. Uh, they give them their right of reply and include their denial, but it doesn't, I think, surprise anyone in this region to have a kind of another iteration of what's widely to believed to be a Rwandan-backed uh, armed rebellion. M23 mm -hmm. uh, uh, rebelled against the Congolese government 10 years ago with Rwandan support. Before that came CNDP in 2008-2009. It's a chapter of history in the, in the 1990s. Uh, Rwanda and Uganda uh, invaded in 96. It was following the the Rwanda genocide, uh, and since then have been accused of, uh, you know, repeatedly entering with their militaries, uh, of meddling and of looting uh, minerals since then. Uh, so in that sense, it's a kind of repetition of this. Why is it happening now? Yeah. Um, I mean, a year ago, Congo's army, uh, sorry, uh, Congo's government let in the Ugandan army in North Kivu in the Turi province, ostensibly to fight an armed group called the ADF. Uh, at the time, relations were not good between Uganda and Rwanda, uh, and I think Rwanda objected to its rival being given uh, access to eastern Congo, where it's uh, made money in the past. Uh, and so what was at that point, you know, that's when we started seeing M23 active again, uh, which a lot of people understand to be Rwanda asserting itself militarily in eastern Congo. Sure. Uh, but since then, relations between those two countries have improved. And then what's widely seen as a sort of very weak, uh, moment for the Congolese uh, government and for the Congolese forces with relations particularly poor with the UN peacekeepers are here. Yeah, uh, it's uh, in, I think probably in many people's view it's a it's a it's an open door. Some might say, or, or uh, well, a good opportunity uh, to uh, to come in again and, for, uh, for the neighboring countries. And and you know when we talk about the neighboring countries, I want to kind of broaden this out for a second for those who are not familiar. And I appreciate that context to begin with. Um, Reagan, when we look at the civilian toll, I mean, the displacement of civilians and also just the deteriorate, you know, the conditions that are deteriorating so rapidly, what is of major concern to you and, and what looks different perhaps this time? Reagan? Yes, the, the major concern is uh, about the shelter for people who are, who are moved from their places, who have been obliged to move from their villages. But also they need food, they need uh, water, they need uh, sanitation. There is a lot of needs, and so far uh, the humanitarian response has been uh, slow, s slow. Right, and at and, the moment. and and I see. Sorry, I don't want to interject. But when we talk about the humanitarian response, I know you're particularly focused on children, uh, Grant. We have. 
um, a video uh, comment, in fact, or I should say this uh, is from the UNHCR's Joel Smith that raises this point. Take a listen to what he had to say. We've, we've seen entire displacement sites uh, forced to flee the clashes, um, including one in Rusuru territory, uh, sheltering 23,000 people who essentially had to flee overnight um, towards the locality of Kanya Rachinya um, and the outskirts of Goma. For many, uh, this isn't the first time they've fled conflict and violence. Uh, we're seeing families driven apart. Uh, many of those that, that first arrived uh, in Kanya Virginia were unaccompanied children uh, who have already lived through that trauma uh, of, of conflict. So Grant, children being abducted, we've heard, you know, either killed, maimed, or even, you know, so far as so much sexual violence reported. What, what concerns you most here? Well, thank you, Ahmad. Perhaps just to, to first of all, um, put a few numbers. Uh, you mentioned tens of thousands, but Mm. But actually, since the the um, the uh, ups, the uh, escalation um, from the, the 20th of October, it's estimated that there are new 188,000, um, bringing the total to uh, since the beginning of March this year, when things started to reactivate. Right. As Matthew was uh, uh, mentioning, up to about 240,000 overall. So in terms of displaced people. Um, 150,000 of those in, in round numbers have arrived uh, just north of uh, Goma and the Nirogongo uh, area in uh, Kanye Ruchinga. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, think of about 25,000 households. So as, as Regan was mentioning, there's a, the, the immediate concerns are water sanitation. Mm. On that, I just want to add, this is a, a zone um, that is uh, well known for cholera. We have done about 160 interventions in just the last uh, uh, week um, on uh, cholera alerts. Um, shelter is a major problem. Some people are sleeping literally on, and this, this is an area with like lava, you know, from previous uh, uh, volcanic eruptions. Um, and, and having, we've seen mothers, you know, have the, their, their babies lying on top of them and then a small piece of plastic. Yeah. So just, you know, when we say shelter, we need to be clear. It's, it really is a concerning area. Right. On the child protection area, um, you know, your question about the, 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 um, the different sort of uh, concerns, we've had, we've since March, um, had 1,500 separated uh, children identified. 1,200 of those have been reunified with their families. Over 200 children, uh, child soldiers, or children associated with armed groups, have been uh, uh, identified and released, and have gone through uh, rehabilitation mm -hmm. uh, services. Mm. And then we have also um, had over 300, and uh, we've had 140 uh, uh, verified cases of uh, gender-based violence. And so the protection issues are significant. Of course, and, and Grant, I appreciate those numbers, those statistics, but of course, as we all know, it's, it's, it's all the more impactful to really hear those personal stories. I know, Malcolm, in one of your packages earlier this week for Al Jazeera, um, you spoke to a woman who survived a rape by M23 fighters. I'd, I'd love to play the clip for our audience, and then we'll come right back to you on the end of it. Take a listen. Gloria, not her real name, says she was pregnant when she was gang raped by fighters from the M23 rebel group earlier this year. There was nobody to help me. When I woke up, I was in hospital. My neighbor had rescued me. I don't know what they used because I was badly torn and my bladder was leaking. Gloria's baby died before she gave birth and was surgically removed. Now she's joined the nearly 200,000 people who fled their homes. The conditions in the camps are bad. There isn't enough food or clean water, and the shelters don't keep out the rain. And while Congo's army and most of its armed groups are accused of widespread rights abuses, the fact that tens of thousands of people have chosen to come here, leaving behind their homes and their farms, gives some indication of just how scared they are of M23. Malcolm, watching that back and knowing all that you know based on your coverage in, in past years, looking back at this conflict, of course, as you mentioned at the top, this isn't new. How does it compare in terms of what the people are having to endure? Uh, well, I mean, I guess for me, what seems, uh, I guess, really 
quite sad about it, or a bit depressing, is that they're having to endure the same things again. Mm. Um, I was here in 2008 when uh, CNDP uh, were attacking Goma uh, in 2012 and in 2013. Um, and the fact that, yeah, it's kind of history, uh, it seems like history repeating, the same thing's happening again, that's terrible. Um, and then, I mean, I guess in the case of, of, of rights abuses, I mean, as, uh, as we said there in the story, it's, it's not only just M23 at all. Uh, Congolese army is uh, accused of, of rights abuses on you know, many occasions over the years, but they're generally better when they're winning, they're better when they're funded, they're better when they're fed and watered. The worst moments are when they're being beaten, when they're retreating. Uh, the armed groups uh, that have uh, been accused of fighting alongside uh, the Congolese army, although they... Uh, also deny it, but including the FDLR and others, the M23, are say, uh, uh, you know, are fighting alongside the M. Uh, you know, they're they're known for rights abuses and brutality in the territories they control. Yeah. Uh, but what's unique about M23 is that it operates in this sense like a conventional army, and uh, and in the past, you know, it's taken over territories, it's yeah. governed them, it's administered them, it's kept prisons mm -hmm. and kept prisoners, and uh, and I think uh, and in the because of that history, uh, because they've done that before, then the population is, uh, and massive parts of it are, are very scared uh, Reg of these guys. Reagan, we just heard Malcolm bring up the fear, obviously the fear factor, not just from M23, but just the escalating situation, and even regionally, which we'll discuss in a few minutes. But I do want to ask you, uh, we heard from Patricia Hoon, she's a freelance journalist. She had a very interesting um, point. I want to play it for you and then uh, ask you something. Go ahead. The M23 rebels have advanced in recent weeks. They have seized several key towns and they are now only about 30 kilometers away from Goma, the provincial capital. What is not for sure, however, is if the rebels had the intention to push forward and try to seize Goma as they did a decade ago, um, what seems clear is that they want to put more pressure and have more negotiating power at the talks that will take place in Nairobi next week with the Congolese authorities. In the meantime, obviously, it's the civilian population that's carrying the worst burden of the crisis. Reagan, when you listen to Patricia and knowing that we've seen uh, civilians attacking a UN peace convoy earlier this week, we've seen obviously maybe the United Nations role being limited. What are, what are your concerns about their, their ability to actually uh, protect civilians? Yes, the, the main thing is that there is, a, uh, there is no longer trust with uh, different regional forces or uh, MONUSCO, even with the FRTC. So that is a big problem when it comes to the population. So the population is not really uh, waiting for for any protection from mm. uh, the army and from the uh, fr from the peacekeepers. Mm -hmm. But that means also that um, when it's come to fear, when it's come to 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 all the the, 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 the tension, people can tend to be also violent, and mm -hmm. that's something that should be taken into account and make sure that the population is a. Uh, uh, we we make sure that the population is getting a. Uh, a bit more information and uh, the, uh, with right. transparency, because if there is no information, yeah. people tend to create fake news. And of course, and, and of course, not to interrupt, but but how big a role has fake news been playing? I mean, we've seen the conversation on social media really erupting in terms of misinformation and fear mongering. Yes, we've we've seen that. You know, there is a lot of a lot of uh, uh, Facebook uh, accounts. Uh, which are uh, spreading uh, fake news and uh, a lot of information that's uh, making people be in all this tension. Like uh, uh, today, there was this uh, tension in uh, the Kanyaruchinya camp where I was, and people were, th there was this rumor that, okay, the M23, it's, uh, they, they are coming, they are just right. some kilometers from here. And that make people move in uh, or, or the, or the sense, and that could be dangerous. Yes, for, for and, and, I see, and I see that Grant is nodding as you're, as you're making that point. And I do want to ask you, um, you know, Grant, we've seen the fear is rising. We've seen what 
hundreds if not thousands joining the fight against M23, volunteering if you will. We also have um, this clip actually that we'll play from Malcolm's uh, package earlier this week, you know, where people are signing up to join the military. A lot of people in our YouTube chat are discussing that issue. Take a look, uh, Grant. These men say they want to fight. Democratic Republic of Congo's army says they're among more than 3,000 people who've responded to a call for recruit. I am here because we are suffering too much. My family, my sisters, they have suffered a lot from war. Some of them were raped. So we're here because from now on, I need to defend myself. You know, Grant, uh, when you hear that, and, and I want to, I want to butt in there. Please, Malcolm, right. go ahead. Uh, in the story, I was, I was careful not to, uh, to, to attribute this claim that these people are recruits to, to the army. It's the mm. army that said that they were recruits. Okay, that's a great point. I think you froze. I don't know. If, uh, and the army. Sorry, you froze been, briefly, they, Malcolm. Go ahead, continue. Okay, I think I'm, I'm continue. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Okay, it seems like we're having a little bit of a connection issue. Malcolm, forgive me, I'm just going to have to cut you off there just because the, we're having a little bit of an issue. Hopefully we can sort that out. But I appreciate you kind of, uh, kind of. I think what you were trying to do is kind of, uh, you know, put that into some context and explain uh, the perspective and who was making that claim. We'll come right back to you, if you will. Actually, let's just try. Continue your point. I think we, we're clear. Go ahead. Okay, let's see if, uh, if the signal holds up. But to me, they looked a lot like guys we saw in uh, 2014, after the time that M23 was defeated. Now, a lot of the armed groups here in Eastern Congo uh, started in the 1990s or the early 2000s, community members uh, defending themselves against uh, the foreign armies, including Rwanda and Uganda, who'd uh, come into the country. And then when M23, which is widely seen to be a, a proxy of Rwanda, was defeated in 2013, the government called a lot of these groups to come out of the bush because from their perspective, what had been a kind of arch rival for decades had finally uh, for once been defeated. Yeah. So we saw thousands of these guys in a demobilization camp. Who then, I think many of them weren't fed. They left, went back to the bush. Others uh, went to other parts of the country. But the way that they sang the songs, they were all very muscular, jogging around together. Yeah. All of these uh, demobilizing militia guys was exactly like mm. what we saw with the people that the Congolese army said when you recruit. So we asked the spokesman if, uh, if are these the demobilized militia guys coming back? And they denied it. And they said that they're not fighting with armed groups. But we're also waiting to see if right. these guys will actually be given uniforms and guns and will be trained. Right. The last time I saw them, they were still camped out there by the roundabout here in, here in Goma. And yes, uh, I, I'd like to comment on that. Please. Yes, regarding the, the, the FRDC, we know that the, the army uh, as well has uh, many problems when it's come to um, recruitment, when it's come to equipment, and when it's come even even about uh, mm. finance and how all these things are uh, are managed inside the army. So I think that's something important. We couldn't just speak about having more men in the army, but we need also to make sure that the army is responsible, is holding, people are holding uh, accountable for all the things that are happening there. Right. And also to make sure that the chain of command is clear and we know who is there and people who has been accused for violation of human rights yeah. should be put aside uh, from the army. And this being said, yeah. there, there is an... Uh, the, the, there is a, there is a real mobilization of the population to make sure that they can participate also yeah. to and, and the Reagan, protection for, of civilians. And, and, and that's, of uh, that's, of course, important. It's also important that we bring in some uh, additional voices from YouTube, people chiming in. Grant, perhaps I'll put some of these comments and questions to you. D. Bodro saying, how large is this rebel group in comparison to government forces? And Ben Mukishi making perhaps a, a, you know, kind of a premonition of what's to come, saying DRC has been purposely weakened by the international community. And Sebastian saying Congo will end up like Sudan divided by two. East will be another state. Do you think, Grant, um, that that's possible, plausible? Yeah, so Ahmad, I just want to come back to, we've covered a lot of ground here. The first thing I wanted to mention is there was a discussion around 
kind of fake mu news and manipulation sure. of, of different uh, media channels. So I think just to run through this very quickly, I mean, first of all, on that, it's v what's very difficult is to do very real-time verification of what's, uh, what's confirmed as opposed to a, a kind of a, a, you know, a deliberate sort of rumor set up to, to generate stuff. Second, I wanted to just comment on the, the call to mobilize the youth. And, and there are two very important things there. Number one is there's an age verification process that has been established with FARDC. Yeah. It's extremely important that that age verification process is, is uh, strictly applied um, you know, when there's, a, there's a, a significant number. And in the same way, also, the, the, there's the issue of the training of new recruits. Right. They Which... need to be pro you know, professionally trained. Well, and then just, I think, you know, a, a comment on your, your you know, this, yeah, these other questions. Please, you're briefly, because we're running out of what time. Go ahead. Yeah, we haven't talked about this is extremely mineral uh, uh, rich uh, part of uh, DRC. Right. So there are, there are a lot of interests around, around these strategic resources. And, and I think that the question of whether the extent to which the, the, the international community or is or isn't involved, I mean, first of all, part of the problem is around the, the you know, some of the other major global crises, such as Ukraine, Russia, uh, and there are a number of others. Right. But, you know, the question is whether the effectiveness, it's the effectiveness of all of the diplomatic efforts. Right. And, 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 and there's certainly been a lot of... That Diplomatic talks are going to succeed. Of course, and I see Malcolm's nodding. He was nodding throughout a lot of your interjections there. And, and Malcolm, before we wrap, I want to come to you based on what you just heard from Grant, knowing that there's been a lot of criticism levied uh, of the UK, of the US. Um, when we look at the macro big picture of why this might be happening again, I want to ask you, um, what if Goma does fall to the rebels? I mean, is that likely in your estimation? Well, uh, the military sources we've spoken to, uh, everybody here who's uh, familiar with the forces involved seems to think that sooner or later M23, uh, with its kind of widely uh, believed to have Rwandan support, could uh, take Goma if they really wanted to. Um, Congolese forces are complaining that they don't have food, they don't have water, they don't have enough ammunition, uh, and they say that the enemy that they're fighting is being kind of refreshed and replenished and is very uh, well armed, uh, although Rwanda does deny it. But then uh, if indeed it was uh, Rwanda and possibly Uganda behind this movement, then I think if they do have the choice, they have the military capability and then the choice of whether or not they take Goma, then uh, a few factors would be that in 2012, that's what really turned up the diplomatic pressure on Rwanda to then pull back and, uh, and eventually brought in international support to Congo to, uh, to defeat them. Um, another possibility is that... Uh, as we understand, they're being supported by uh, significant numbers of Rwandan soldiers. If that's the case, they'd be very visible here in the city, uh, and, and that would make uh, Rwanda's position harder to, uh, sure. to defend uh, internationally. But in terms of the negotiations that are coming mm -hmm. up that, uh, that have been mentioned, I think both sides will be interested in militarily getting as strong a position uh, as possible. And if the incoming forces just surround Goma uh, to the north and to the west, Rwanda is to the east, then that would even that alone would put them in a in a strong position for negotiations from a military point of view. And uh, very very quickly, if I can, Grant, uh, to circle back, we you know people making these concerns that the international community is purposely weakening the DRC. What do you make of that? Yeah, I just want to uh, come back to an, an earlier comment from Reagan, which um, I, I agree with. The humanitarian response to this crisis is is. Is sub, it, it's not at the scale it needs to be. So we need immediate, we need significant re, re, resources. We need to move IDPs to safe sites next to water supply. And we have identified these. These are being um, uh, discussed with authorities. Well, well Grant, Grant, the, Grant, that's a brilliant point to bring up. I'm unfortunately going to have to cut you off there, but it really is going to be a question to see how that gets scaled up. That's all for today. I want to thank Reagan, Malcolm, and Grant. Remember, at home, you can always find us online at stream.aljazeera.com. Thanks for watching.